Greetings, sir. He's one of the most colorful characters in gaming. Lord British and Richard Garriott are really the same person. Some people would think that he was a little weird. Who helped jumpstart a genre. He got his foot in the door before anybody else in the massively multiplayer market. He evolved with the whole PC industry and then blazed the path for the massively multiplayer. There were humble beginnings. The Three Car Garage became our manufacturing and shipping department. And emotionally trying times. And I would be literally curled up in a fetus position on a chair in physical pain, I mean literally gut-wrenching physical pain, about the nightmare of what is about to happen to, to us as a company. And things weren't always what they seemed. And it was very clear there was not a match at all. But he left a lasting legacy. There are very few people who stay on the cutting edge of an industry like this for 20 years. He didn't start the RPG genre, but he certainly reinvigorated it in the early 80s. This is the story of a video game wizard and his journey through knighthood. Low British Richard Gary, you could probably say, is one of the founding fathers of the games industry. It's the story of Richard Garriott. As a child, Richard is literally surrounded by space. One, zero, ignition, lift off, lift off. My father was a Stanford University professor and then a NASA astronaut, and that took our family to Houston, right across from the Johnson Space Center, where all of our neighbors, literally both my next-door neighbors and the people behind us were astronauts, and the people all around us were either astronauts or engineers. And his mother's career helped pave his own. And my mother is a professional artist. And so uh, if you really think about what computer games are, you know, computer games are high-tech art, engineering art. And so uh, it was really a perfect background for getting into this business. Richard doesn't develop an interest in gaming right away, but by age 14, he reaches a turning point. An epic story helps lead him on his way. First one was being given the book Lord of the Rings, which was the first and still largely the only fantasy work that I've read. The second thing was uh, role-playing games, uh, like Dungeons & Dragons. So 1974 is the year Dungeons & Dragons was published, and so I was one of the early adopters of that game. But these times aren't filled with just fantasy. So I began to work with or play with these personal computers, uh, not really even at home, didn't have one yet. At school, young Richard is fascinated with computers and teaches himself programming. I began to create little fantasy games on this teletype. I would draw walls for corridors of a dungeon, dollar signs for where the treasure was, letters for the first initial of the monster that might be moving around the halls. And I was very fortunate that getting in early was uh, the key to successful self-thoughtness. Richard jots down his own D&D type games. Their names were D&D 1, D&D 2, D&D 3. I actually had to write all my programs out on a, in a notebook. And makes a very smart bet with his father. He said, uh, you know, that game, this is huge, this will never work. And I said, oh, this is going to work. I've been paying very close attention to the writing this out. And he said, I will buy half of an Apple II computer and you pay for the other half if when you type this whole thing in, it works. And as a prop to his birthplace. I was born in Cambridge, England, but I only lived there for one month. He creates his own moniker for his Dungeons & Dragons games, Lord British. And so as I began to write my first computer games, I just started putting, you know, Lord British as a character, as one of the many characters within those games. So as soon as we had the Apple II, the next logical thing to do, of course, is to take, I've already done 28 of these simple character graphics games on a teletype. I turn around immediately to do the same thing on the Apple II. And so I came up with a new name that I thought I literally made up, which was called Akalabeth. Akalabeth becomes his first game for the Apple II. Akalabeth is not a very good game in the sense of it's a cool demo, but there's no way to win the game. There's no plot to the game. There's no sequence of events, it's just randomly generated dungeons and treasure hunts with, with no goals to accomplish. But good enough to impress his boss at Computerland. He said, you know, well, Richard, you know, your game is every bit as good or better than the two or three games that existed at the time that were hanging on the pegboard wall and Ziploc bags. And he said, you know, your game's as good as those, you, we ought to publish it. Enterprising Richard likes the idea, but decides to publish the game himself. 
So I went out and invested what for me was a ton of money, $200. And I went literally just a few doors down and went to the print shop and I had these printed up and uh, had my mother draw me some pictures to put on the front of it as graphics. And we started hanging them on the pegboard in the store there and about 20 copies sold in a few days there on the store wall when suddenly I got a call from California. And that call represents the opportunity of a lifetime. It's from a game company called California Pacific. So I flew to California on their ticket and they handed me a contract, said we'd like to uh, publish your game nationwide, so I signed the contract. My royalties were $5 a unit and they sold about 30, 35,000 copies of those. And if you do that math, that's about $150,000 for a high school senior. He goes on to the University of Texas and immediately begins working on a follow-up. So immediately I said, wow, if this, if this game will do this well, which was already a bestseller, with a game that I had never even intended on releasing to the public at all, if I do a game knowing that it's for public consumption, I can make a much better game. And that's what began the first Ultima. And the birth of the Ultima series will launch gamers into a new world. It's filled with unusual creatures and medieval environments. In 1980, the creative computer programmer Richard Garriott begins working on a world that would change RPGs forever. And he uses his Lord British character to help market the game. Well, my first publisher, you know, was going like, well, what's this Lord British thing on here? And they went, well, you know, Richard Garriott is not really a very memorable name in a marketing sense. Let's drop Richard Garriott off the credits and let's just leave Lord British. Ultima is a two-dimensional computer animated sword and sorcery fantasy world with an ecology, economy, and ethical code of its own. This world is called Britannia. Richard releases the second game in the series, Ultima II, Revenge of the Enchantress. They used to be uh, the good old days as they might be called when one guy could make a game. And that's exactly what he does. With only $70,000 scraped together from savings, his parents, and private investors, Richard and his brother Robert start a new company, Origin. They work out of his parents' garage. Literally, we had a three-car garage with an art loft over it. The small room was Robert's the business office, and the big room was me and a few of my friends who did all the games. And the three-car garage became our manufacturing and shipping department. Richard works at Origin while still attending classes at the University of Texas at Austin. But he gets a serious wake-up call. I was taking a, an assembly language programming course at UT, and I actually flunked the class. And it was the first class I'd ever flunked. And it was what I was doing for business. That told me, anyway, that I had to make a choice of doing one or the other. It was actually very difficult. My parents were extremely supportive. They were like, well, heck, you know, no question. Go do the gaming stuff. So he drops out of college and pursues gaming full time. And in 1983, he publishes his first game under the Origin label, Ultima 3 Exodus. Once we published Ultima 3 through our new company, Origin, we moved out of the house. And Origin really begins to take off. At the time, those games were incredibly loved. They, they really were, they had such a following. After I'd written three games, I now realized, okay, I know how to do the basic structures. Now I want to make a good game. The result is Ultima 4. Ultima 4 took two years. It was the first time I actually really sat down and tried to truly create a world, tried to create a back history, tried to create purpose to your existence as a player. This fourth installment introduces the eight virtues and the avatar, a role model hero that has to stand tests of morality. So I wanted to create a game where if you were going to win, you actually had to walk the straight and narrow. And I was worried that people would think I'd gone way off the deep end and that I was kind of preaching. And so I actually was worried that Ultima 4 might be a flop. A flop it wasn't. Ultima 4 sells more than 200,000 units, and Origin becomes the darling of the industry. 
those games were so successful in, in sort of picking up that, in that they, they were classic fantasy of, of being the good guy, of rescuing the princess and slaying the dragon and those kind of classic stories. Richard has big plans for the next installment of the Ultima series, but it will come with a hefty price. He must make a tough decision. So we sat down to make this decision of what are we going to do? If we quit now, we could walk away with millions of dollars. If we ride forward, the good odds we're going to be millions in debt. And I would be literally curled up in a fetus position on a chair in physical pain, I mean literally gut-wrenching physical pain, about the nightmare of what is about to happen to us as a company. And in 1992, Electronic Arts, a San Mateo computer game company, comes to the rescue, buying Origin Systems for $30 million. EA has become a powerhouse for, for probably very good business reasons. It obviously just fundamentally knows what it's doing and being able to support companies like Origin and appreciate, the, I guess, the brands in Ultima. The deal uh, for selling Origin was worth you know, a number of millions of dollars, so it was uh, clearly a, a whole other plateau. Origin digs into EA's deep pockets and begins working on a new installment of Ultima that has a twist. All the time we've been creating these solo player games, we've always gone, you know, wouldn't it be great if my buddy could come with me too? The boys at Origin put the game to the test. So we actually put up on our website, we said, hey, anybody that wants to come beta test, we want you to pay us $5 to send you a disc for the privilege of beta testing. And we had 50,000 people send us $5. Oh my gosh, we were right. We've hit on something really big. In 1997, Ultima Online is released. With the launch of Ultima Online, he got his foot in the door before anybody else in the massively multiplayer market. Ultima Online marks the beginning of a new age in online social interaction and gaming. It goes far beyond the text-based single-player adventure games. Just sitting in there and typing and the text appears above the head of your avatar and then you see somebody else actually respond and talk to you, and all of a sudden you've done something that you've never done before. With a special appearance from Lord British himself. Part of the ultimate mythos is always that I, Richard Garriott, get to go to Britannia and I play Lord British while I'm there, but it's really me. But Lord British is not immortal. I would hear back from players, and almost always they would kind of snicker and eventually say, oh, by the way, also, I took great joy in killing you. And I was like, hey, you know, that's not good. So I began to create future Ultimas with code in place to protect Lord British from being killed once I realized people were doing this. Then people would write in and say, ha, I found a way to kill you anyway. As the Ultima series grows in popularity, so does the Lord British persona. Richard shows up at trade shows wearing the regal garb. Lord British and Richard Garriott are really the same person. You know, I have, of course, extremely well-grounded sense of reality. He felt he could crown himself, and he, uh, he didn't make himself a king. I mean, you've got to give him credit there, only a lord. It's serious. He has given it up, and it's a persona that he's uh, pursued, and most people refer to him as Richard, Lord British Garriott. He's absolutely serious. In the United States, it actually always went over very well. In Japan, it actually went over very well. But I have to tell you, the one place it did not work was England. In England, not just anybody gets to be a lord, not even Richard Garriott. First press member walked up into the room and kind of looked at me sideways and he gave me the once over and said, so what the hell are you supposed to be? And it was like, uh, I was, I was crushed. It was like, and I had to spend the rest of the day there and I had already signed up to do like three days of this. And this was the first member of the press and uh, it, was, it was a total disaster. Richard's D&D style crosses over into his very real life as he builds a castle in Texas. It was stocked with trap doors and secret areas and all this cool stuff. But a very real world invasion shakes Richard up. Well, at 3.30 in the morning, there's a big crash. I wake up, so I actually go to my closet and I grab a, uh, a gun and I call the police and I crack open my bedroom door and I look out my bedroom door with the police on the phone and the gun in another hand and uh, police say it's gonna be 15 minutes before they can get there. Well, we have this five minute stare down and this person then turns around and starts walking down my stairs. And so I'm going, hey, you know what? I've just said stop or I'll shoot. So I aim off to the side and pull the trigger. Doesn't face this person, doesn't even hear it. They finally get there five minutes later, find this guy, he's, he's in one of my bedrooms, and please come in and you know, push him to the ground rather forcefully and handcuff him. And it turns out this person's had a serious psychotic break. But a home invasion isn't Richard's biggest problem. Creatively, things are about to take a drastic turn. The last six months of my time there was spent in this 
battle effectively of my vision for the future versus the other senior members of the corporation's vision of the future. And it was very clear there was not a match at all. For eight years, Origin and game giant EA were seemingly a match made in heaven. Together, they created one of the most successful role-playing game franchises, the Ultima series. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. EA wanted him to do games that he didn't want to do. They, they asked him to make uh, like simple little Java-based online games. We need your help. And he really had no interest in doing that. You are a fool. Goodbye. And in 2000, Garriott leaves EA and Origin, the company he founded nearly 20 years before. The departure is painful. Origin was still a place where I assumed I would be spending the rest of my career, and Electronic Arts was a company I presumed I was going to be spending the rest of my time with as well. So to leave that nest and go that far away was much more traumatic. Upon leaving EA and Origin, he signs a non-compete contract. And so we forged a deal that basically allowed me to continue equity participation with the company for a period of year. That way I was still earning money even though I wasn't working, so to speak. And during that same period of time, they had use of uh, Lord British within the Ultimas. So it was a good mutual deal. I have no time for you. And then Lord British left. He takes a year off to set out on a real life adventure. We went to Russia and did cosmonaut training where we uh, did the neutral buoyancy tank in space suits, we did the zero G parabola flights. We went to Africa on safari. We took submarines uh, down to, uh, on a treasure hunting trip. Meanwhile, the online world continues to grow. Korean-based NCSoft releases Lineage. It quickly becomes the most played game in Asia. So Lineage, which is you know, phenomenally popular in Asia with four million players, is having a much more difficult time here in the United States. NCSoft sees Garriott as the gaming tycoon with enough status to bring lineage and its success to the U.S. Even before we met the folks at NCSoft, they already were you know, uh, beta testing lineage here in the United States and only had you know, a few hundred players playing it. And it's interesting to kind of look at well, what are the factors that has made this phenomenal success in Asia and how can we maximize the success in the United States? And it turns out that's a more difficult problem than we thought because we actually thought we knew the answer to it and so far we haven't proven that that's the case. Lineage is a fabulous game about regional conquest, so there's a great political game about uh, ownership of property, command of these uh, castles and the power that that uh, has within it which is why it's so popular worldwide. However, the U.S. audience is clearly much more critical of things like animation detail and presentation, which we knew, we had instincts to say that that was true. It's just uh, turned to be far more true than we had hoped. And Lord British is expected to be reincarnated. Oh, of course Lord British will be coming back in games. Uh, you know, not only are we now with NCSoft, we're actually, Lord British is actually taking a, uh, a visit, a tour inside uh, the game Lineage. And that's not all. Offline, the real life Lord British is working on his new game. It's called Tabula Rasa, which my brother is working on. And so Tabula Rasa really has a, a, a one key goal from a gameplay standpoint, and that is to blend the best features that we evolved over the last 20 years in solo player gaming and combine that with the best features of massively multiplayer gaming. Tabby the Rasa, first of all, is not a medieval sword and sorcery game. I sort of view uh, Tabby the Rasa as a mystical, futuristic, farcical world. Well, if history proves itself, then any game bearing the Lord British name will be worth playing. I think that being involved with NC stuff, it'd be great to see that there's opportunities for him to, to be involved with these other projects. Our long-term strategy is to release a game, uh, about four games a year. We're developing a lot of products internally, so one product is called Lineage 2. Lineage 2 is a fully immersive 3D environment versus a top-down view. 
we believe that with Lineage 2, we'll be able to keep a, a much more exciting pace to the game. He didn't start the RPG genre, but he certainly reinvigorated it in the early 80s. But he was the first person to really make it work online, to really introduce a massively multiplayer social element to it. But I don't know that I would say that's inventing a genre. Do not be so sure. But he certainly took an existing genre into a really, really exciting direction. Lord British, Richard Gary, you could probably say he was one of the founding fathers of the games industry. His original games, the Ultima series, were absolutely the games that got a lot of people into the industry as it is right now. Richard Garriott is kind of a role model for a lot of us because he pioneered things when there was nothing happening. He showed with Ultima in the early beginnings that, you know, one guy could make a big difference and trap a lot of people into these experiences. You could say that he's still on the absolute cutting edge of the industry, and there are very few people who stay on the cutting edge of an industry like this for 20 years. He evolved with the whole PC industry and the experiences he was creating, and then blazed the path for the massively multiplayer, you know, with Ultima Online. I wouldn't be surprised if Richard Gary again just surprises us out of left field with something that sets a huge uh, evolutionary trend. I just enjoy making games that are ethical parables. May all of the virtues be with you, my son.